who I have. Uh, Rebecca Bolton, you're the manager of uh, New Order, but um, you you have much more to do than that, and we'll come to that in a, in a while. But I wonder how you first came into the orbit of um, of the band Joy Division, as it was then. Yeah, well, I, actually, it wasn't ever Joy Division. I moved to Manchester in 1981 to be um, a student and um, then needed a part-time job, as many students do. Um, and there was this fantastic new club opening up, the Hacienda. So I, go, I thought, oh, I'll go and get a job behind the bar there. Did, got a job behind the bar and loved it, actually. And honestly, that was probably where I met most of the people that I'm still really good friends with now. It, it, was, it was great. It was, it was a really great place to meet people um, and I worked behind the bar there the whole time I was a student when I finished my degree I was a uh, briefly a cleaner um, which <laughs> was a bit of a grim job but was quite well paid actually and so it should have been some of the <laughs> things we had to deal with on a Monday morning were not pleasant you're talking um, about a nightclub. I know. Yes, <laughs> indeed. It was more oh, grim, grim stuff. Um, and then worked and also worked on the reception, you know, getting taking the money off people as they were coming in. And so through that, really, I just met everybody then. Um, it coincided with Rob Gretton, who at the time was the manager of New Order, and obviously managed the catalogue of Joy Division, um, really recognising that he needed help. He'd, he'd had a few health issues and he, he was just basically really busy and was doing it all on his own from his spare bedroom. So he kind of, Rob being Rob, didn't form place an advert in the paper and interview lots of people. He sort of came across me, friend of a friend. Actually, it was, a, it was the girlfriend of Mike Pickering, who then went on to be um, of M people um, and now is uh, very high up in A&R at Sony Records. I was very friendly with his then girlfriend, actually still am very friendly with her. And um, we were out socially and Rob said, oh, I need someone. Do you, do you want to come and work for me? I was like, yeah, all right. <laughs> and it, was, it really was like that. I don't think that happens anymore like that. Anyway, that's what I did. And just, I really, I really liked it. I really liked Rob a lot. Um, yes. I thought he was a great person and was not really quite like the portrayal you see of him in, in 24 Hour Party People and Control. He was actually a lot softer, sweeter person than those characters. Um, he, he had his moments, but he was really a nice guy. <laughs> He was. Um, and I learned a lot from him. Uh, we went on to manage a couple of things together. We, he had his own record label. By that time, there were a few of us working out of offices above the Hacienda. Um, and, it, and it grew really from that. And then very sadly, he died in 1999 um, of a heart attack at the age of 46, I think. Mm. And the band just being the band were like, oh right, well you and Andy Robinson, who was their tour manager at the time, well you might as well just carry on doing it. So it's like, okay, well we'll just carry on doing it. And that's how it happened. But truthfully, it coincided with a time when the music industry was changing a lot. And I think that we had to learn on our feet quite a lot so things that we'd learned from Rob started to become not quite so relevant and it, there was a lot of things that he he had not had to deal with previously so that's how it happened that's how I ended up working with them and, and then that's continued to this day so doing something something right somewhere <laughs> along the way <laughs> <laughs> well let's look at what it is you do oh actually no first of all let's let's be clear 
You mentioned um, Rob Breton's label. I suppose that there still is a heritage there, but you have in particular the estate of uh, Joy Division to look yes, after. Yeah. Can you tell us something about what that <coughs> what that means, what that entails? Yeah. Well, actually, it's it's a very very busy estate as you can imagine it's it's just i would say over the last 20 years has increased in value massively so it it entails ensuring that all the releases are up to date that um and we've started to mark anniversaries and last year for example was the 40th anniversary of the release of unknown pleasures well we marked that by a limited edition release which was phenomenal it, the success of it was phenomenal it, it went to number two in the album charts uh, just a re-release on vinyl um and we did a, a reverse we worked with peter savile and did a reverse sleeve um i worked with the merchandise company and we did a limited edition capsule collection with a very hipster company in london called goodhood um, and we had like a pop-up store there that was really successful we um can i just ask you what is a reverse sleeve oh okay so the original sleeve is black with white wavy lines so we just did it as a white sleeve with black wavy lines, <laughs> which actually is the original scientific image that's the actual image peter savile actually reversed it for the sleeve so the original um image which was found by bernard um in the central library um in an american scientific journal um was white with black wavy lines on it I so see. that was the limited edition release then the thing that i was particularly proud of we did we projected unknown pleasures Im image onto the town hall in manchester we projected it onto another building um like a very tall skyscraper building in manchester um on the actual release date which happened to be on a saturday so it was great really so we did it on a saturday night and we had somebody record it and and there was there's a few pictures of people walking around going what what's that <laughs> you know quite quite surprised we just did it as a sort of gorilla kind of thing and to be you know it cost quite a lot to do but the imagery from it was great and it was just a really really nice marker the other thing we did around that campaign was we I felt strongly that we needed to raise some money for charity, uh, for mental health charities. So we did a giveaway in Manchester City Centre on the actual anniversary, which you get obviously on the Saturday. And we made 2,000 t-shirts, um, limited edition t-shirts in conjunction with CALM, which is the mental health, uh, it's the, the male suicide uh, charity, preventing male suicide. And uh, Debbie Curtis felt, feels very strongly about homelessness. So she wanted to donate to a homeless charity also, which of course has a lot of links with mental health. So we joined up with both charities and, just, and gave away these t-shirts and asked people to donate to those charities. It, you know, if you, if you were lucky enough to get one of these t-shirts during the day, then we we ask that you donate something to the charities. So that that was great. Um, obviously, a lot of press attention around it. So that I mean, that is just one bit of it. Obviously, um, so you have going <coughs> thing. <coughs> so you have new order to manage. You have the estate. Uh, yeah. You have, um, I suppose, the estate of Ian Curtis, which yeah. is, is yeah. slightly separate. Um, yeah. Oh, and uh, the, the, doesn't uh, didn't Bernard have a little project that oh, ele he, he, ele electronic electronic yeah electronic. he he released um, he released record he recorded um, record the music with Johnny Marr and actually they had three albums out so that and that was very successful actually mm. um, so yes I look after that as well so there's actually always something going on there's either a catalogue reissue or 
you know, we like, like I say, that unknown pleasures thing. That was a special occasion because, you know, we really did a lot. And actually that, that whole campaign has been nominated for a, a Music Week award for the best catalogue campaign of 2019. Mm. Um, so, so there's that. But then, and that's actually the really interesting fun bit. Oh, that also, we also worked with a, um, a designer who... Um, who had um, commissioned videos for each song on Unknown Pleasures, and we released those on YouTube um, each time as they throughout 2019 as they were as they were finished. And we had some very, you know, we had some very famous people get involved with that because actually a lot of people like Unknown Pleasures. They like Joy Division, and they did it on tiny budgets just to be involved. So that, so there's all that and that's really fun and that's really great. But there's also like today I'm looking at, I've got an, a call with the accountant later to go through the royalty distributions to December, 2019, which have just been paid through. So we have to work out who's owed what and that's quite boring. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I've got later on some, an, some analysis of publishing statements. So there's that kind of thing as well. So there's always something, it's always something to do. And I have to say during this kind of lockdown period, I am finally getting on top of all those jobs, boring jobs that I keep <laughs> thinking, I'll do those one day. Well, that day has come and <laughs> I'm doing them. So, yeah, well, so there's lots to do. Yes. Yeah, so on one side, you have the musicians, the band the, the, yeah. of, of, uh, on one side. And on the other side, you have record companies, uh, video artists, um, uh, you have the live uh, publishers, all the, yes, all of that. And then you in the middle have a little support team, I suppose you could say, of an accountant, a solicitor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very uh, Sadly, he, he has become very important over the last few years because we've had some, you know, I mean, it's, it's no secret. There's quite, it, there's issues between the original members of Joy Division and New Order. One of the band members left in 2007 and that's been quite difficult legally. So, yeah, I, I've got a lawyer that I talk to quite a lot, actually. <laughs> okay. He's great. Uh, <laughs> we get on very well. <laughs> so you're the, sort of part of this central, you're the, 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 the top end, the brains of this central spine. On, yeah. one, on one side, the band, on the other side, the music yeah. industry, the music world. Yeah. And um, I suppose you can't, you can uh, bring some order, uh, new order, bring some order into predicting um, anniversaries and that sort of thing. Yeah. But you can't avoid the, the, the surprise of a phone call for somebody um, uh, wanting to do a project like the video maker and, and so on. So it's... Uh, so every day must be some sort of there must be some sort of new experience that you have to deal with. Yeah, I think that's I, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it's it's structured. You know, there's on the one hand, it's very structured. So, for example, you are always accounted to by the record company and the publishers half yearly. Actually, our publishers have just introduced quarterly accounting. Um, so there's that structure in place and that, and actually it's almost and that quarters sounds really boring but a vat quarter kind of marks the year you know in, yes. in stages so there's always a structure that you're working around i have to say the structure it does tend to be accounting um but then also there's you know the other side of it we talked a bit about catalogue. So obviously there's a catalogue of Joy Division, there's the catalogue of New Order. So there's New Order projects that um, up to and including Peter Hook leaving. Um, and then there's new New Order. And for that, you know, there's, a, there's new music, there's touring, and that's very busy. And there's a structure there almost. We've got, a, we've got quite a large road crew. Um, who we work closely with and we really get on with and it's very much a, a, a family if you like 
Um, and when you're building up to touring, there's a structure in place. You have to do this, you have to mark off the things building right up to leaving, and then we go. Um, and then there's, there's a bit of a pattern to those days as well. So, you know, you get there and you might, you know, organize people going out for dinner, and then the next day there's a structure, right? You're going to do the sound check at this time, you're going that time. And it, with, there's a pattern, there's always a little pattern. Um, musicians like to think they can throw in little you know curveballs but actually they quite like the routine of it as well mm. you know when I mean it always makes me smile slightly every morning on tour when it's a gig day I get you know little messages in the morning what, what's happening today and you think well you know what it's going to be the same as it was two days ago when we did the other gig, but hey. <laughs> but you, so you, and then you have to send them out the message via WhatsApp. Some of them you do it WhatsApp, email and text. <laughs> and we have like a group WhatsApp, you know, where I, I just say, you know, one o'clock, Steve goes to soundcheck, two o'clock, Gillian goes to soundcheck. <laughs> so, yeah. so there's a structure. Yes, it's 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 interesting you sort of mentioned that and I think same for all work you know you're, you you lecture there's a structure in place there isn't it you you teach students at particular times and then you do other things at other times so yes you did tell me incidentally I think that uh, isn't it the case that one of your um, band likes a view in the hotel from the hotel and the other one <laughs> doesn't yeah. like to go any further than the first floor or something that's right yes yes <laughs> so have, you have those little have those, things to deal with as well yeah always <laughs> yeah there's always something you know yeah yes so uh, can i just ask you about um uh the bigger picture of organization um, I suppose that still um, a lot relies on um, uh, recording projects, that the live comes on the back of the recording projects to promote the album, for instance. Where do you start? Oh, okay, that's a good question. I mean, just to qualify that slightly, a band like New Order are in a bit of a privileged position um because obviously they built up um a career over decades and can they can actually continue touring as do quite a few bands touring without releasing any new music whatsoever i mean i think a really good example is the cure you know they're a massive band the cure massive live draw they don't really release new material and we wouldn't have to although we have done um so I think it would start with one or two of the bands saying, yeah, probably getting a bit fed up of the touring cycle and mm. thinking, yeah, I've got some ideas for some music. Um, <clears throat> I always laugh about Bernard's ideas that he always he has little notes, musical notes all over the place. And I get asked, by the publishers quite a lot if he's got anything and I, I always sort of I have this image of him having a cupboard of ideas <laughs> that he can just pull out and he needs a bit of a sort out like you know like probably most people are doing at the moment sorting out their um, their wardrobes because they've got nothing else to do. <laughs> um, well, I was told that Enrico Morricone the film composer um, does lots of um, has got some pre-prepared tapes and um, directors would go to him and they say, well, I'm thinking for this film, a very soft kind of music. And so, ah, you want tape 94, 94D and he would get it out <laughs> yeah. and play. <laughs> yeah. So it's a bit like that, yeah. A little yeah. bit like that, yeah. But I, and then I think, you know, they'll get to a stage where they want to develop some of those ideas. And it's like, oh, well, should we, should we make start, you know? And then... That's, so they just kind of make a start, get in the studio a little bit and start 
uh, messing around together then separately I mean there's a lot of a lot more than it used to be I think separate working and taking ideas to one another and then at some point the the, the ideas are, are there enough to say well, should we get a producer to have a look at this? So say on the last uh. New Order album, there were, a, there were a couple of ideas which were working really well, but it was thought, mm, like, you know, I could see Tom Rowlands from the Chemical Brothers working really well on this. And he came in and added some really wacky little touches as a producer. And it was, you know, and it was good. It worked really well. And then the ideas develop, they turn more into songs and then you've got, it sort of builds up like that. And then by that stage, you've got maybe 10. So at that point, right. Okay. This needs properly recording, gets properly recorded and then um, mixed, you know, and generally they'll go to somebody else to mix. Um, mm. Just to get a bit of a fresh perspective. Sorry. Inserted into that bit would probably be, on the last album, which was released on mute, um, Daniel Miller got quite involved and had some really great ideas. And we're just, he's, he's just a great, great person. You know, he's, he's just positive all the time, but at the same time can steer. If he's not quite sure about something, he'll steer it round. Um, he's, he is great. That was one of the best moves we've made in a long time. Just feeling like it was separate from everything we'd done before. And it felt really like this was new, new order, a completely new setup, a new record company. And we, and actually we maintained a great relationship with Warners. They, and they were really understanding about it. They got it. They were fine about it. So, it, it was great, actually, and an uh, inspiring guy to work with, I have to say. And I think even the band who, you know, you get to, when you've had that many hit records as they've had, pretty hard for someone else to come in and tell them they don't think their ideas are going to work or that they might want to try something else. <laughs> so that's quite a hard thing to do. But Daniel obviously had the gravitas to be able to do that. So, yeah. So then it's mixed and then you kind of got to a stage where it's like, well, we've got enough songs now, really. And that's, that's it. It just kind of evolves. But there's a seasonal element to it, isn't there? There's a structure to yes. getting it promoted, getting it out through the windows yes. and uh, yeah. all of that. And then the live well, yeah. no, no, you've covered the live element. Um, well, live, but, uh, you would want you would want probably to be able. I mean, it's a actually what we have really found in the last, I would say, three to four years, even even in the last two years, actually, things are getting booked so far in advance, i.e., venues, festivals, um, that you you are booking your venues can be up to two years in advance yes you know so you kind of got to have a bit of a structure in place and some of the band really like to have a deadline for finishing the album they break the deadline of course but they <laughs> like the idea of having the deadline because it actually gives them something to i get that you know it, it gives you something to work towards you don't always make the deadline but mm. it gives you that you know, I, idea that you might make the deadline. Um, but your ideal position, if you're a big, if you're big enough to be headlining festivals, is that you will be have a finished album out towards the end of the summer previous to festivals the next year. Because a lot of festivals start looking at who they're going to book for the next year. So if they know that you're going to have an album out, then Glastonbury is a really good example. So, um, if they if Glastonbury know that you are a potential headliner and you're going to have an album out prior to Glastonbury or around Glastonbury that year, then you're going to be more interesting to them to go top of the bill. So it's right. a bit of a, a you know a game to make sure you're hitting the the right targets really. But if you're a newer band, then you need your album to be even further ahead because you, your album needs to be recognised and heard before they'll book you. For us, if we said, we've got an album coming out in March at 21, say, um, 
those those bookers or promoters don't really need to hear it because they know okay it's going to be a new order album it's going to do well that's fine but if you're a new band they they need to hear it they, they're not they're less likely to take a chance on you so it's slightly different depending on what stage of your career you're at well, talking of stages, I wonder, under the present stage we're in of the lockdown, what the effect is on your management day? Well, <laughs> I'm finding it harder to feel motivated, that's for sure. <laughs> that is definitely for sure. I mean, we, we were in Australia um, and cancelled our last date the Australian section and came home a day early um, and then a week later obviously we were locked down completely um, we, for us luckily we had no plans to tour this summer until September when we uh, and it's on sale still on sale um, we have got dates with the Pet Shop Boys as a co-headlining tour in America during September quite a big tour for us um, and so obviously it's a quite a big financial uh, tour for Live Nation. Live Nation have bought the tour as a package. Um, it's gone phenomenally well. We, we sold out the Hollywood Bowl quite quickly and they added a second Hollywood Bowl. They were about to add a second Madison Square Gardens but didn't put it on sale as we locked down so that uh, now won't go on sale um whether or not we will be going in september is who knows i, I really couldn't tell you at this today i can't tell you whether we'll be there or not but obviously what i would have been doing at this stage is starting preparation so for example i spoke last week to our lighting designer who uh, started his conversations with the Pet Shop Boys lighting designer and you know we're talking about the, the stage set they have a they're a little bit more theatrical shall we say than <laughs> art. Um, they need it more than you do possibly <laughs> yes possibly I don't know oh, yeah um, so that's kind of on hold the planning for that has to be on hold because I won't spend any money on it until I know it's definitely going ahead. Mm. Um, so that slowed things down a little bit. Um, I'd always planned this period to get a little bit more on top of my admin. So I am doing that. Um, but I've got, but I don't know if you can see behind me, but I've got boxes of stuff that I've got to go in filing to go into storage. Uh, merchandise samples that go into storage but of course can't go to the storage unit to take them I've got two uh. massive bags full of shredding that I can't take <laughs> to the shredders so my office is starting to feel a little bit claustrophobic actually <laughs> um, but I am you know uh, for me personally it's better for me to have a routine I'm better knowing that I've got a routine I work from home anyway um, so it's fine I just get up to be honest I'm just getting up a little bit later um, <laughs> and in a bit and and making sure that I walk the dog during the day which I wouldn't normally do so yeah okay can I ask you um, before we close about the the permission side of things um, mm. uh, syncing and all of that mm. I think I heard um, last night a, a preview of um, ordinary people which I think is on BBC one tonight and I thought yeah, I, I heard Normal people, normal people. Normal people, people sorry. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. It's a, a great book. I, re I read it last year and loved it, so I was quite excited to see that it was going to be on TV, yeah. Um, yes, I think we've got, uh, we have got uh, Love Will Terrace part in that. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, well, well, how actually, does that work? How does it... How I, does it I'm really... Uh, this, this is definitely one side of the industry that I'm personally quite interested in and I do quite a lot of work on um, I work really carefully with our publishers publishers are the key to sync licensing really because um, they for us anyway for New Order and Joy Division we work with Universal Music Publishing um, who are the, probably the biggest um, and I've got really good strong relationships with their sync team particularly um, and 
so what tends to happen it can happen in a variety of ways but say for something like that 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 director will have had a very strong idea of what they wanted musically and they would have just requested it and the request would have come in it would have come it always has to come through to me um and i will look at it and approve it or not approve it i mean something mm -hmm. like that is a bit of a yeah fine that's that's fine it's a, obviously a, a good cultural creative reference for us no problem um tv things that tends to be okay film generally that tends to be okay obviously interestingly we had um a massive success december january time the trailer for wonder woman 84 went online um, and it was, and actually it's worth checking out. If you just Google Wonder Woman 84 on YouTube, the trailer will come up and it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant, the trailer. I mean, I'm not sure the film's going to be brilliant, but the trailer is brilliant and it's Blue Monday. Oh. Well, it's actually, it's a mashup of the original Blue Monday and a cover version of Blue Monday. So, and it merged, and actually it's really good. It's really, it's great the way they've done it. Um, but we saw, and I, that's the other thing I've been doing while we've been locked down is getting around to looking at our streaming um, stats um, and our digital analysis um, and going through that. And we had massive spike in streams of Blue Monday in December and January and, I, and YouTube views as well. So, and of course we make money from that. So we, A, we made a load of, to be honest, that was a big, big, big sink for us of money for that Wonder Woman. So we got it on the publishing and on the master side. So from Warner's and Universal, Warner's being our record company. But not only that, the knock on of that is all the views of something like the trailer online that we get. So it's streaming, it got, it was shazammed constantly. You know, it was a, it was a big success for us. Um, and then, so around the time of any football, we tend to get a lot of, we get a spike with World in Motion, of course. Um, but advertising is the one that you, we tend to be more careful of. So we would review any advertising requests quite carefully. Mm. Um, and we do turn down some advertising. Um, if we think the product's not right, um, we did have one recently for um, a a, um, a food yeah. product, a food product, let's say. Um, I mean, it was quite well paid, um, but it was just, oh no, this is just going to look so bad if we do this. So we turn that down. Um, but yeah, they, the, so basically the publishers get the requests in. Sometimes they actively seek them out and work carefully with music supervisors. Um, I've got a few contacts as well. I'll talk to them. And between us, we generally, it's, it's a bit like advertising New Order and Joy Division's music to those people that are going to place the music in a way that we want it to be placed and we get paid for it. <laughs> I don't know how it works, but now if you if you've got if you're successful with sync licensing, that is a good good revenue stream, very good revenue stream, particularly oh. in this day and age when you're not selling so many physical products. Yes, of course. Um, to conclude, uh, I wonder if you were to an, uh, appoint an assistant, what sort of person <laughs> you'd be looking for? What the sort of personal qualities that uh, you might well, appeal to you hmm. somebody quite easygoing um but also somebody who was much more techy than me <laughs> <laughs> that would be the main priority uh, who could things that i do that just take me a while to get going on they could just do it like that and had a real interest in um streaming and digital um I mean, I, you know, I do keep up. You have to. You absolutely have to. And someone with a very, uh, with a lot of attention to detail. Because nowadays, again, and, and actually going right back to the beginning of when we started talking, thinking about Rob Gretton, 
he, obviously he had a lot of attention to detail on certain things, but the things that you have to have attention to detail on now are not things that he ever had to think about. And that's to do with revenue streams. So back in the day, Rob would have thought about a publishing, a publishing deal, a recording deal and live income. That was it, three income streams. Now you've got to be looking at where you've got, you know, all the um, collection societies around the world, um, the merchandising, the streaming, the digital, you know, all of that sync licensing. There's so many revenue streams now that we have to really look for. And he didn't really back in the day. I mean, he had his other, there were other issues, obviously, but, um, but yeah, it's, it, so you've got to have great attention to detail and be interested, just be interested. Thank you. Well, Rebecca, that's been a wonderful uh, account of, uh, of your work and uh, your aspirations <laughs> and so on. Um, well, it's good sometimes just to, to sort of to think about, oh, yes, actually, I do have to do that. Oh, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> It's helpful to me occasionally. So, well, in yeah. summary, you bring order into new order. Yes. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much. All Bye. Right.